This episode of the Fine Home Building Pro Talk podcast is brought to you by Loctite's Tight Foam. The best builders take weatherization seriously. When they need to seal a gap that's too small for insulation, but big enough to create a draft, they reach for Loctite's Tight Foam. With three formulations for everything from small cracks to the biggest gaps, there's a tight foam product for every job, including a low expanding product designed to seal the rough opening around windows and doors. The high density foam forms a tenacious bond to most common building materials, stays flexible to prevent cracking when materials move, and keeps air, moisture, and pests out of the house. Builders who care about energy efficiency, comfort, and durability choose tight foam. Visit loctiteproducts.com for more information. So they're looking for 10, 15 different ways they can save labor, but what's really important, it's, it's a key caveat of that, they don't want to, we can always find ways to save time. Um, it's, if can they save time without sort of reducing their quality or cutting corners. Welcome to the Fine Home Building Pro Talk Podcast, a regular discussion with building industry professionals. This is Senior Editor Patrick McComb. Today I'm joined by Dave Ellis and Mark Guthrie of Fast and Master. You can find the Fine Home Building Pro Talk Podcast and the original Fine Home Building Podcast at finehomebuilding.com slash podcast. You can leave feedback and ask questions there too. Guys, it's a pleasure to have you on the show. Thank you so much for doing this. Thank you for the invite, Patrick. Glad to be here. Thanks. Uh, can you please tell me uh, what Fast and Master makes, a little history of the company, where it's located, if you wouldn't mind? I'll let you guys decide who wants to answer, and you can uh, take turns or you can play it however it comes up. Sure. I'll let Dave crush that one. How about that? <laughs> My name's David Ellis. Um, I am the director of sales for Fast and Master. Uh, we make billions and billions of screws uh, in the Massachusetts area. Um, we've been, uh, throughout my career, I've been accused of being a screw salesman. Uh, but what our company does is obviously we make the the benef- you know the benefits of the fasteners for, uh, of the fasteners, I should say, for the pro. Um, you know, whether that's building faster, um, reducing labor, meeting code easier, um, any of these things, and improving craftsmanship. Uh, is, is what our company does. Dave, what do folks use these for mostly? You get um, home builders will use these structurally uh, where they're replacing sometimes uh, things that, like ties and hangers. You have deck builders is a huge part of our business. We make uh, hidden fasteners. We make clever little uh, hidden plug systems. Um, it, you'll see it a lot in deck building. And how many folks work at the company? Has it always been? And I believe it's Agawam, uh, Massachusetts, right? Yes, uh, we have our employee count fluctuates a little bit. Uh, right now, we're hovering around 650 employees. And how many are in manufacturing versus other things you that need you need to run a company? Uh, the majority of them are definitely in the manufacturing side of things. So we do everything in Massachusetts from taking raw material to the finished good. That's through heat treat, plating, forming of the screw. Um, that's going to take up the vast majority. You'll have about 100 and 150 folks that are uh, in the sales marketing side. And Mark, what do you do for the company? Uh, I'm the uh, resident geek. Uh, I deal with uh, <laughs> uh, anything having to do with the uh, the research and development of a screw. Let's say from uh, you know from its uh, or a connector, whatever we decide we're going to uh, put together as a system to benefit that that pro. We learn it from that end, and then I'm uh, responsible for then following that through from the fundamental testing. Um, you know, how does it work in one piece of wood? And then system testing in a wider variety uh, of systems, um, how does it perform? And then following that through to code compliance, so third-party testing straight to code compliance. And then finally, how do we put that on a box? How do we put that in a document so it's easy to follow, uh, easy for the code official to inspect? So kind of run that gamut from product you know, development through to making sure we uh, meet code and it's an easy solution. Mark, how does one get to be a, a you know, a fastener nerd? <laughs> it's a great one. I uh, kind of fell into it. I had real estate as my background prior to that. I probably did one summer as a kid building houses, but to always had that kind of uh, attraction towards how do things work. And it could be, in this case, it was it was fasteners and uh, uh, wood to wood connections. We're, we're not really as much into concrete and steel in the Fasten Master world. 
So just going deeper, learning more, uh, testing alongside great um, uh, institutions. We've done uh, Virginia Tech, uh, um, Washington State, uh, just learning and absorbing as much as we can because obviously screws have been around for 2,000 plus years, but we still find new ways to use them and kind of improve the, the experience at the contractor level. Um, so everything you learn about wet wood, dry wood, uh, density of wood, it all folds in uh, to how you, you know, make the solutions work. Forgive me for pointing out. It sounds mm. like uh, you're an engineer. Are you? Are you a PE, or uh, is this something you've been trained to Funny, do? Funny, uh, yeah. So I've I've never been a. I did the you know the normal four year uh, business type of uh, acumen, uh, but uh, I didn't go straight to uh, engineering. But I always knew when I was in business, I'm like, this sounds pretty boring. I want to do something a little bit more in my skill set. So I kind of came here and became the guy who said, well, why don't we tell them this or that? So I didn't have a classic training. That said, I've stood in front of engineers and trained them. I stood in front of code officials. I go every few years to the uh, code development cycle. So you might mistake me on TV for, uh, in this case, a podcast for an engineer, but uh, hmm, not classically trained. But, you know, it just goes to show if you really love something, you don't necessarily have to have the tile next to you. Now, that said, we do have uh, on-staff engineers, a lot of the, the pros that uh, here internally pros uh, that do get the job done. But they'll send me out with my uh, my suitcase to do all the testing and all the things that then we bring back in-house and, and scrub. Interesting. Yeah. So, Dave, how did you come to Fasten Master? So I graduated college and had a job uh, with a newspaper in the St. Louis area. Uh, my role there wasn't to do anything journalism related. It was they put me in sales of advertising. So this would have been just after 2007 time. Not a great time to be trying to That was to the sell perfect time to enter the newspaper business. Am I right? <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and, and then, um, you know, through some networking on my on my men's league ice hockey team, I was on of all things, uh, was a fast master regional manager. And uh, I got the opportunity to be in field sales. This is going back a while. You know, pretty young. Um and ever since then, it's just been an awesome journey. I've always loved, you know, wood shop, construction, um, worked building decks for, for summers, um, mostly manual labor part, none of the, the really craftsmanship aspect of it. Um, but now that I was in that role in field sales, and since then, the different roles I've had till I've gotten here, um, just loved being a part of people who have such pride in what they actually build. Um, and I felt like I, I was a small aspect of that. And that just gave me a lot of energy. So, Dave, uh, uh, a field sales rep for Fast and Master, are they just cold calling on a job site? You just drive up in a truck or, or are you visiting a job sites after getting a phone call or email? How's that work? You know, under job titles, um, you know, we have 45 field sales reps is what you'll, 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 they're called. And it's funny to say this sounds hokey, but like, I don't really think of our people as salespeople. I never thought of myself as a salespeople, salesperson. Um, we, we're showing up and trying to observe as much as we can about what a builder does. And your question was about, are we cold calling? So what we, what our team does is we, we have our stocking dealers. We have over 1500 in the United States. And we asked them if we can set up a demo table up front. We call it an impact event. And it, during that time, contractors are obviously coming in. We're in the morning. They're picking up their materials. Um, and we're asking for a couple minutes of their time to learn about their business and maybe show them something new. In we're exchange for a donut or, and a T-shirt, I'm uh, guessing, yeah. right? <laughs> <laughs> we can do that, you know. Um, we, we, you'll see our reps with donuts for sure. But uh, <laughs> uh, we don't want to be viewed as the guys with the free donut. Uh, but we'll, uh, we'll be pretty generous about giving out free samples. We really think our products are one of those things where – you know, if, if you, we give you a free box of screws, we can be pretty darn confident that you're going to go use them and just absolutely love them. But we get invited also to job sites. That's where we really spend a lot of our time. And at that point, you know, you're, they're telling you, what's really cool about that is you go there with one thing in mind, you're like, ah, I think this person could really use this one of our products, timber locks. And you find five or six things that that contractor is doing that they don't even know that there's a better way. And you're like, well, really? Like this has been out for 10 years and you didn't even know? And they're like, no, I don't even know. You know, so it's easy to assume that like when we're doing trade shows or we're out in front of, you know, uh, leading lumber yards that everybody must know about a through lock or a ledge lock or whatever it is. Um, and we find every single day applications where we're, you know, delighting our customers with something new they didn't expect. 
So can you guys talk about how the products are tested? I think you both would agree that none of this matters if it doesn't work and it has to work because lives are at stake. I think you'd agree. So do you build uh, actual buildings or do you make small mock-ups that stand in for larger structures? How does that all work? Great question. I think I'll grab that one. It's a, uh, we, we will test during the product development phase uh, two specific criteria that have been developed for um, how does the thread engage the wood and what's that overall performance. And then you divide it by what's known as a safety factor. Um, in wood, uh, typically it's three to five. So you've built in this insurance of a, uh, of a you know, a reduction. Um, so you're testing it on a, a small scale. Uh, but then as we develop new ways to use the products, we find, again, it's a 2,000-year-old technology, but what if you put it in at an angle, or, or what if you're putting a, a, your ledger is a wet piece of southern pine, let's say, and uh, has to then go through a half inch of sheathing, there may even be insulation somewhere in that, and then into a, um, uh, a rim board that might be engineered, it might be just old SPF from 30 years ago. So how does that perform really comes from a full-scale test, so we'll test to the prescriptive codes that are there. In the case of a ledger attachment, there's a lag screw schedule, and we went to Washington State, Virginia Tech, and I built the same mock structures that they uh, they were the ones that got the credit for putting that into code because they tested it at their universities. We did the same level of testing, and then throughout that process, uh, everything's third party evaluated, and a code report uh, uh, that's been by an accredited, uh, you know, entity then gets posted. But yes, it definitely has, we'll do full scale uh, roofs, floor systems, uh, ledgers, decks, um, all to get the better knowledge. And, and sometimes we'll find we'll tweak things based on that. Um, because in an individual performance, uh, we didn't catch something. So, uh, and, and what I mean by that is maybe we need to go a little closer or further away from an edge or what have you. So there really is a recipe and we, we do have to figure it out on full scale to give everybody the confidence that they're doing the right thing. I got to believe that your products are often used in situations where they're subject to, you know, wind events and seismic events. Like, how do you test for wind forces and earthquakes? That's a great one. Uh, so for wind, well, um, one thing, Dave, I was, uh, when he speaks to Fasten Master, we also have a, a, a company that, you know, within our OMG umbrella, meaning OMG Fasten Master, we have OMG Roofing. And roofing, we've been in that industry for 40 years. Uh, so uh, as wind goes across the roof, we have a, uh, a whole uh, roof test assembly, uh, or excuse me, um, uh, facility uh, where we'll test full roof systems. So we're very much been in it for 40 years. When it comes to a deck um, where our clips might be going into the edge of a groove on a uh, composite deck, let's say, uh, we'll test those assemblies in a small scale wind Let's call it a tunnel, but it's uh, and uh, what it'll try to do is force the failure, and then again a safety factor is applied, and so we'll do things, uh, you know, mocked up in all, uh, you know, all different sizes of uh, scale. Uh, but yeah, that's how we win. As far as seismic, yeah, there are some uh, uh, criteria that will actually mimic a, uh, a Kobe Japan event, and uh, we'll do that type of testing to replicate what happens when it has that. Uh, type of um, uh, seismic or cyclic uh, type of uh, load on it, as opposed to just applying a greater and greater load at a static rate. Um, and do yeah. you need like a shaker table to do that? Or are there ways <laughs> to simulate those forces? I mean, because I know there's only a couple of those or three of those in the world, right? So it's right. Those, a, those would be ones we would send out for sure. We don't have a, a shaker table here, but um, and as we you know we go, there's also calculated ways to do this to get it pretty good, and then then you do send it off because obviously it's expensive uh, to do a, a shaker table, and it's something we'd uh, we'd obviously have to put out for uh, put a, oh, yeah. uh, to a third yeah. party. What about like uh, ensuring that stuff lasts? Uh, out in the weather, you know, like you mm -hmm. mentioned, decks are a big part of your business. How would you ensure that the coatings and whatever you're putting on them to make them not rust is working? That's a great one. Uh, there's a few ways uh, in, in uh, that you can check for uh, the level of uh, corrosion in salt, uh, which is, you know, really just a kind of a, a thumbnail uh, sketch of, of its performance. But what we've done is long-term testing in the back of our facility. Um, we've done, uh, we do UV stability. We have that in-house uh, so we can shoot it with UV and, and see what happens. Chemical exposure, that's huge. Of course, in the deck world, as things change from straight up 
um, you know, mild copper to a more aggressive copper. And uh, there are standards out there in the case of uh, ICC or International Code Council. They do have a, a standard that uh, you test yours uh, uh, against a hot dip galvanized equivalent, and then you find that if you're equal or better based on that tester, uh, test, long-term exposure, et cetera, that uh, then you can be calling yourselves approved for that chemical. And that's what we do is we'll, we'll do that third-party testing along with the in-house uh, UV and salt spray testing. And one of the things that is really important to builders, obviously, when they think of quality, you don't want to see rust and things like that. We don't want to see anything fail. But for their business, so many of the top pros, they build the business based on referrals and quality. And obviously, they don't want to do a callback. That costs some money. But the bigger thing that they potentially lose is that referral. So for our company, our brand, Fast Masters, if we're going to have a product that the pros want to continue to use, it's going to have to absolutely be something that they're confident they're going to get the the best possible quality and even surface rust, something that's not going to you know rust through the entire fastener, even that's enough to cause someone to think to themselves, geez, I, I didn't maybe get the most quality product, you know, at the end result. And when I, they're thinking product, I'm thinking entire deck, not just the fasteners. It's everything that that builder's just decided to use. One thing I'd like to add there, Dave, it's a great point. Thank you, is uh, we have a guarantee on every box and it's for the lifetime of the project. Um, in, in other words, if it does rust three years down the road, we want to get that phone call. And what we take from that not only is, hey, we have this uh, this opportunity to uh, re-engage and to make better uh, that relationship, but also the product. And we've gained knowledge over, again, I'm going to say 25 years of Facet Master uh, to make better coatings, uh, more UV resistant, et cetera. And, that, and a lot of those things that are in the back of the house come from uh, learning early on uh, what's important and to stand behind that guarantee. Are you actually doing like uh, exposure testing out in the real weather? It, you know, I'll be honest, uh, some of the like ASTM testing methods I've read about mm. are kind of wacky. Mm. The boat test for WRBs uh, jumps to mind as the skin that people put on their buildings to keep the weather out, right? Um, do you, I mean, like, I think you'd agree, uh, testing something in a lab is different than letting it actually be in the field. Absolutely. There, to the extent that we uh, send fasteners to Arizona or Hawaii and there's some, you know, there's a test, I would agree with you. There's, there's, a, stand, there's, there's a lack of a one-to-one -one relationship to a salt spray test. A lot of times we'll be asked, hey, what does that mean, 1,000 hours or 1,500 hours? And it really means nothing once you move something to a coastal environment, per se. Uh, so the testing that we've done, uh, not just the fact that we've been out there for 25 years and, you know, whatever we get for feedback, we do do testing here in our facility. And we just, we, the laboratory of, of, of uh, having the fasteners out there in the actual environments. Now, one thing we will do is when it's a coastal environment, a thousand feet or less from from uh, the coast, we'll, we'll recommend stainless. You know, we don't want to give them the wrong message, which is, hey, this is impervious to all. At its root, most fasteners are carbon-based. And so we have to get it right on the coating, but also uh, in some uh, extreme environments, uh, you want to make better decisions. Uh, uh, so stainless might be one of the options that you, you select. But yeah, we, we test it outside. Uh, tested in all environments, but really lab only goes so far. You're very correct on that one. I think one of the things that's important for the listeners to understand about the, when they're selecting quality of product, you know, the saying, you, you get what you pay for. We're never going to be the least expensive. Uh, but one of the things that's important about a reputable company, especially American based with the amount of employees we have, is we build in safety uh, factors that are far beyond what we would think would be like, okay, this is going to last 50 years. Let's just put 50 years worth of coding on it. We're going to be way beyond that. Dave, I'm sure uh, one thing I know about builders and remodelers is they're not scared to share their opinions about the things they use, right? Uh, what do the users who buy your products say they want from them? What, what, is, what, are the singular, what is the singular thing they want? Builders are looking for ways to pick up efficiencies, you know, get a quality they want to improve, but they really want labor is something that comes up almost every single time I'm on a job site. Um, so they're looking for 10, 15 different ways they can save labor. But what's really important, it's, it's a key caveat of that. 
they don't want to, we can always find ways to save time. Um, it's, if can they save time without sort of reducing their quality or cutting corners? Um, I had this went to this job site. I think it's a saying that must a lot of people must say. It's the first time I ever heard it. But he, the contractor told me I was like, "Oh, that was really interesting." I was observing uh, one of his workers do something. He's like, "You know, you can find the most quality way or the uh, most creative ways to pick up speed by finding the laziest guy on the job site." The <laughs> 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 funny little joke that he had, but uh, it, it's um, we. I think about that a lot, though. Is is can we do that, but without sort of circumventing you know the height the quality part of it other part of my answer for you there patrick is that sometimes builders won't necessarily know what what they what will improve them you know their job um it's it's one of those things where they have this experience uh and it's proven and they're not necessarily um going to be super excited to be an early adopter for the sake of just trying something new because it's new you know, they like you mentioned earlier, there's a lot at stake, especially when you're building structurally. Um, and that can be liabilities or just having on, you know, um, just weighing on your heart of that. You know, if, if you don't build to this quality, someone could get hurt. Um, so it's just really important, you know, for us not to be coming off like, oh, we got this new gizmo. Just try it because it's new. You know. I, uh, I can tell you the first time I used a product like yours was to attach a ledger board and I found it to be life-changing. And I think anyone who was a carpenter at the time when those, these products started showing up would agree. Um, I've heard some manufacturers have fastening schedules and some don't for uh, deck ledgers. Uh, you think it would be easy to calculate how many screws you need based on the tributary loading on the ledger and the uh, load rating of the screw, but it's not that simple, am I right? Right. And we initially used to get those calls and it was, uh, hey, how many screws do I need? I see a table here. It tells me how many pounds per screw. But then when you get into it, you've got a wet ledger. You've got a dry interior uh, wood uh, frame that you're trying to attach to. And so, yeah, it, 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 you would think it's pretty simple to just do the math, but it really becomes complex when you start to add in all those different layers. So that one-to-one -one testing to the uh, prescriptive. Remember, before 2006, the code said only don't use nails or toenails subject to withdrawal <laughs> on your ledger. That was it. So, pardon me. What they ended up doing after that was testing a prescriptive means by which a lag screw or a through bolt would, would work. And so we did that one-to-one -one comparison testing because you do want to know, <clears throat> pardon me, you do want to know uh, how that's going to affect the performance overall of the system. And so we've tested the system one-to-one one one against the code prescribed method and then come up with that pattern, put it in every box. Every time we have a task-specific uh, connection, which is a lot of our fasteners, we really do want to drive not just, you can use these universally in some, uh, but we do want to drive home a ledger lock for a ledger, has a specific amount of threads to always engage that rim board um, it has a specific diameter. It has a specific head so that you're getting the greatest clenching force of that connection. Um, but, yeah, based on the testing, you want to have that one-to-one. -one. You want to have to uh, resolve in their mind uh, the need to go any further and calculate a single thing. I'll ask both of you because uh, I bet you have uh, both have experience with this question. But what can uh, carpenters get wrong using these products? I I'm assuming you can use things that aren't made for outdoors outdoors mm. uh what else can you get wrong it it's a great question um i think part of it is that sometimes the way that structural screws can be viewed especially by the, the term structural is that their general purpose they can be just used everywhere the other assumption is the thicker that the fastener is just is going to be the stronger that it is and this is one of the areas that's really interesting um Thicker, obviously, when we're testing it, can mean that it's has more of a you know uh, ultimate values to it. But when you put it into a wood, because these are wood to wood fasteners, is you have to think about the interaction between the wood and the fastener itself. And I'll just give you a couple examples here. Um, is we have a screw. There's a screw that we have. It's called a timber lock. It goes up and through the top plate into a truss, and that can be you know take place and meet code for wind uplift. 
this screw is actually one of our thinner screws. It's not, not one of our thicker screws. And part of the reason for that is the, if you're going on end into a two by, like a rafter or a rafter tail or a truss, is if it's too thick, you'll end up splitting the wood. And when we do these tests we were talking about earlier, especially when you're talking about a system, is that splitting of the wood is where it fails. Um, oftentimes, when you see deck failures or, or anything in a wood to wood connection, you're not very often looking at fasteners that have just sheared in half. Uh, often what you're looking at is the wood is either rotted or it's split and it's withdrawn from the wood, but not necessarily split. So one of the things that you can see where um, where maybe a fastener is like, oh, I'll just use the biggest hunking you know, fastener I can use. It's going to be the strongest. And it, 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 it doesn't always have always is that way. Um, a couple examples for us that seem a little bit counterintuitive is that we've very intentionally decided to engineer products that niche themselves into an application instead of a one screw does all. Um, so you're going to see fasteners um, from our company that are branded specifically for a ledger board or for a, assembling an LVL beam. When we're attaching multiple LVL beams, we found out that the shorter threads will actually suck that beam together tighter. And even, in fact, we even put a wing on our fastener so that it grinds up the glue in the LVL, which keep you from being able to overdrive the screw. So it can actually spin out, which most of the time someone would look at and say, that's that's terrible, that's not a good thing. But using impact drivers, which the, with the torque that they have, is if you overdrive it, especially into something like a LVL with a lot of glue into it, you end up hearing this cracking sound and that ends up hurting your, your, your strength. Uh, many other applications when you look at, you know, um, structural screws. And I don't want to just come off as a fast master commercial. There's lots of very good options out there. Um, it's just important for listeners when selecting a screw is that you're trying to find the screw that does the job you're looking for the best, not just buying a tub of screws and saying, oh, I can use these in 50 different spots. Interesting. I would Do you want to add to that, that, Mark? Yeah, the only thing I would add is uh, kind of almost uh, piggybacking on that edges and ends. So in every application that's task specific, we're going to tell them the limit uh, of where you want to keep this from the end of the piece of cut wood, uh, whether that be a ledger or a rafter, and the edge. So you, you have to imagine the boundary. And when you encroach upon that boundary, then of course you might be more prone to splitting failures. So we want to keep people from making that mistake. Good advice. It's interesting. I, I learned some stuff there. Uh, have you guys had uh, supply chain problems like the rest of the world with the business? How's, how's that work? What about uh, finding enough work? -ers? Great question. Timely. I'll let Dave start because I think you see things in the field that, uh, that you've, you can translate back into our, and I'll add in. Yeah. Like, like everybody, uh, you know, we didn't magically predict that our demand would skyrocket far beyond the capacity that we had. That building was off the charts for a period, right? I, oh, I understand yeah. it's kind of stabilized a bit, but at the beginning of the pandemic, it was completely out of the norm. Yeah, it, 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 it's just funny as, as for, for me and in our sales team is being in a situation where you have so far beyond the demand that we can actually supply that uh, you're not necessarily looking for new customers more than you're trying to give them as much information about when they can get the products as you possibly can. Um, one of the advantages for our company is is having having all the machinery in Massachusetts facility to take something from raw material through the entire uh, process. Um, and actually put it into a box and send it out. So we had advantages, but we only had so many machines. So that's one well, of the limitations. For, uh, forgive my interruption too, but you guys are buying steel from China is my guess like everybody else. Is that true? We're definitely globally sourced. So we could have some from Canada, uh, some from China. But I mean, that's has that yeah. been a problem getting the raw materials? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Definitely. Even still, I think it's a tight market. Um, and then some other implications might uh, boy, they don't have enough chips to put in Ford trucks. Ford isn't buying steel. So there are some other implications that have a ripple effect that are positive in some cases. So uh, no way to forecast that, obviously, over those last two years. But I think we've got a great handle on it and a great purchasing team to make sure uh, we've always been uh, you know, open to the – there's many sources. But 
Um, obviously, the quality is comes first, and so we want to make sure whatever we are uh, sourcing. Uh, and Dave, by you the just way, said we, you you didn't yeah. have enough capacity to meet demand, right? That was that was that was part of the problem. Yeah. Yeah, as I yeah. say, the steel we've never ran out of steel, although it's it's gotten dangerously close. So to your question is, it, it's it's definitely you know, on our minds, it's never gotten to that point where it slowed us down, you know, majorly where we've shut down machines, but there's little things that happen that you just don't expect in the, how we're all, um, connected. And, and one example is, uh, you know, the container ship that turned sideways in the Suez canal had chemicals on it. We don't get anything that goes through the Suez canal, but the chemicals that were on that was used by, uh, one of our suppliers that, creates the plastic lids for one of our boxes. So it's nothing to do with our fasteners, but we couldn't put a lid on a bucket of Tiger Claw because uh, for a little while because that chemical was, <laughs> was stuck. Do you sell them anyway? I, I'm, I'm sure people want them, right? Uh, we, there were times where we get very, uh, very creative with, <laughs> with solutions for what, what we actually put it into the box. What about uh, finding workers to, to make stuff? Yeah, we've we've done a pretty good job here locally, uh, no doubt. Uh, we have a long list of as uh, that has fluctuated of uh, people that we need at machines. Uh, but over time, uh, we are a very lean, and I, I say that uh, because lean principles mean uh, we've been able to uh, be more efficient with each worker. Uh, we also uh, all give time here. Uh, it, it's not just about uh, the person who's uh, punching the clock and, and, and making screws. Um, we have a uh, across the board um, uh, philosophy here that's uh, just uh, uh, helping. Uh, everybody helps out, I guess I should say. And so uh, uh, everybody from the VP in the corner to the middle manager here, uh, we all spend time in that factory at some point or another during the month. Um, but yeah, we, you know, we find ways to make it work and, uh, it's a great culture. And I think that helps, uh, locally people know our name and they, they respect it. Uh, and so those 450 or so workers that, uh, Dave was talking about earlier that are here and, and making, uh, fasteners day in and day out, um, you know, that that's the core of our business. And we, you know, we, 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 you know, we can't underappreciate any of their work. Dave, you mentioned it earlier, uh, I'd say in my experience, there are several good manufacturers of the things you make. Um, why should a builder or a carpenter choose the, your fastening products over the competition? The big reason for, for that for us is how I mentioned uh, being task specific intentionally. So one of the things about our fasteners and why someone would select it is if you won't buy a box of Fastmaster product and say, I'm going to do everything from attaching to trusses, LVL beams, um, doing my headers and my ledger board with this single box. We're going to make something that's very specific uh, for an application. So, for example, our ledger lock screw. It's called ledger lock. because If you walk in the door and you want to put a ledger up, it makes good sense that you'll buy something that's called ledger lock. The reason for that, though, is how it's task specific is a ledger board oftentimes it's it's a two by material you know pressure treated goes through something like a five eighths plywood you know the the side of your sheathing of your house and into the rim of the house that can be a single or a double rim so our screw the length of the shank is uh, is perfectly set up to where it passes through that ledger board and the house on the bare shank without threads that allows there to be a much tighter connection and the thread start once it engages into the rim of the house. So that is a very specific application, not something you think is generally what you're going to you know, find other than that one application. And all of our fasteners are fine tuned specifically for one application. That doesn't mean you can't use a headlock screw you know, uh, around in different applications. It just means if you have a specific one of 12 different applications we've decided we're going to go after. Uh, if you find that screw, it's going to be the best for that specific job. I meant to ask you earlier, and I forgot uh, if we can just back up a little bit. You were talking about just now the uh, specific fasteners and a recent uh, fine home building feature, uh, Fernando Ruiz showing how he used these long screws. And you mentioned it earlier, Dave, to connect the uh, trusses to the top plates. And there's similar arrangements for connecting uh, wall studs to bottom plates. In this instance, Fernando was trying to eliminate uh, wood solid wood sheathing, OSB or plywood, 
uh, in order to save money and use uh, foam insulation uh, as a thermal break and uh, better performance. Um, I don't see those a lot. It seems like an incredible time savings. Uh, in fact, you and other companies make fixtures to make it so you can do that from the floor uh, to connect your roof to the walls. Why don't we see that more? And can you talk a little bit about your specific system, either one of you? I'll, I'll start, Dave, and certainly uh, uh, chime in. The um, the continuous load path, I think, is what you're go going at. I did read uh, the article and, and uh, um, How'd we or, do? Or, listen, or listen to the podcast. I think, uh, oh. I think um, the fact that there are a lot of things in code are moving towards higher energy. Uh, new products are developed to uh, create more thermal barriers and whatnot. Um, and with that comes the challenge of, well, can we can we still fasten uh, the cladding to the side? And, uh, or uh, how do we make that same structure without sheathing that was holding uh, it, uh, getting greater values? Uh, how do I uh, make it work? So yes, our fasteners going in at angles, uh, we kind of, like I say, we pioneered that, but yeah, we, 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 long before uh, people were using a screw to go up at an angle to catch that roof to a wall, um, we were looking at that, pushing that with our timber lock, and then developing the whole concept of down the entirety of that wall. And it just happened to be in unison with or um, at the same time as that, that thermal um, insulation uh, taking the place of the sheathing. And so it was adding all that strength back in. As to why we don't see it as often, I guess, uh, boy, uh, it would be great if more people adopted earlier. But as Dave said, some people are hesitant to that, whether it be new ways of insulating. That nobody wants to be the first guy, um, but we try to make it as easy as possible. As we see early adoption, uh, we learn from them and we try to translate that so a wider uh, base of contractors and pros you know, uh, start to appreciate the value of it. We have to, we have to be the messenger in, in some cases. Do you ever have a client, Dave, uh, you know, have a light bulb go off when you show them these connections instead of having to put on hundreds perhaps of, uh, you know, rafter tie downs or truss tie downs to the top plate? It, the light bulb, it's a good one. Uh, I, I, I wouldn't say that some of our, the ways we market our fasteners and applications have been because builders, well, going back to your question before, because builders had this request of us. Uh, we're on the job site. We make a long screw. Geez, it would be fantastic if this screw did this one thing for us. And you just kind of go, geez, that's a pretty darn good idea. You know, let's, and after you hear that once or twice or 10 times, uh, you start to go back to the drawing board. Um, and we have nine mechanical engineers that work in our new product development center. So we have the, you know, the teeth to be able to pursue these sorts of things. Um, you know, in our company, it, it just absolutely has to be launching brand new products every single year. And we have a pipeline of a lot of really good products. And some of them are ideas that our pros have given us, um, which is really cool. And in, in, in some of the best deck builders in the country are home builders are on, you know, our speed dial, so to speak, of where they know if they have a good idea or a light bulb moment, they can come to us and say, you know, it'd be really help my business. I don't even want royalties. I just would love it if you did this one thing for us. So uh, it can be uh, just a great connection that we have uh, with the pro builder community. It's a smart company that listens to their users, their end users, their customers, because they will tell you what they want and they will tell you what's not working. If you pay attention to them, I think you have a pretty good chance of success. I'll just give you a quick example of that. Um, when composite deck building uh, or composite decks first started to come out, there was, it was great. You know, it's this recycled material. It's uh, going to last longer. You don't have to refinish it. Um, but there wasn't a fastener for those decks. So people were using wood deck screws to try to fasten down some of the early composites. And they were getting, of course, um, you know, much bigger heads than they wanted to see. The color matching wasn't right, but they were getting, you know, mushrooming or flaking in the material. Um, and our company, being a screw manufacturer, uh, we were the first to invent a composite deck screw. You know, so it went in, it was our trapeze one, uh, went into the composite decks and it really put us on the map. It uh, was, we were the only company to have it for a long period of time. Um, but pros started to say, you know, geez, it would be a lot better 
great, thank you for solving that problem, but it would be better if we just didn't even have a screw at all. So we start to pursue hidden systems, and one of them uh, was a system where our com composite deck screw actually countersinks below the surface, and you put a plug that's been cored of that material in. Pros then say, okay, you know, that's great and all, but searching for that plug, dropping them on the ground, it's a giant pain. Like, even so much that I don't even know if I have the time to really use your product anymore. Um, so then we go, okay, how can we solve that? We put it onto a collated strip where the grain is all facing the same direction. Easy to see the variegations in plugs. And it's just the evolution of contractors asking us for how they can make the product better. And then us take, be, taking a leadership position in what is going to be next. Um, and we got a pipeline of things that are absolutely fantastic. I can't wait to, uh, to, um, to get, get our pros hands on it. I, uh, I don't suspect you're going to like spill the beans on stuff you got, <laughs> uh, coming out. Right. It's one of the few things that they said, Dave, you're going to be on this podcast. Don't, don't talk about some of the things you know about, <laughs> but uh, soon enough, uh, we have some things every year. We'll, we'll launch somewhere between, um, three or four, what we think of as incremental sort of improvements uh, on our product lines, and usually one something that's brand new. Uh, and we definitely are going to meet that uh, in the next 12 months. And there's, uh, Dave, I'll just say the, uh, we, we, we enjoy the interaction at a trade show booth uh, where we'll do some of these local contractor focused ones, not just the international home builders uh, type of one in, out in Vegas and Florida and whatnot. And it's a it's a real joy when somebody comes in and says, "Man, you showed me uh, our through lock. You know, it's a takes the place of a through bolt without pre drilling. It's literally ten seconds uh, to put a bolted assembly together." They'll walk up, they'll see it, they'll say, "You showed that to me two, three years ago. I don't build a deck without it now. What's next?" And they'll literally walk in and say, "What's next?" And that's part of when you said, "Hey, why do people want to purchase from you?" I think sometimes what they appreciate is. We just saved them time. I want to save some more time this year. What else do you have? So we enjoy that uh, quite a bit. So do you guys have like uh, an interest in DIY home building and improvement? Do you like use your products on your own projects? Absolutely. Dave, I'm going to let you start with that because you had a <laughs> great one. Oh, you know, the... So I grew up in a house that's over 100 years old in St. Louis, so my dad and I would tinker on things all the time, uh, built of wood. Um, so this is far, way before I ever worked for Fastmaster or maybe even before our company existed. Uh, but now I live in a stucco house in the desert. Um, so I don't even have a deck, which is really lame, but I dream about it all the time. I feel, feel like it's like that scene in Christmas Vacation where I'm staring out the window. <laughs> Wouldn't it be great if I had a deck and could use my products on it? Yeah, no, I, I, I've i got a deck that's uh, I just purchased the house within the last two years, and it's it's got the first generation of composite on it. So that's, that's a future project. It's got guard posts that were notched and they're leaning over. And, uh, you know, one of the perks we have is we can try out new products. So I've, yeah. uh, I've used, but yeah, it's just like the mechanic who has the car that has a little bit of a skip to it. Uh, boy, I've got a deck that needs some help that I'm going to be doing over next <laughs> spring. <laughs> Do you guys like that stuff or is it just something that needs to be done? I love it. Actually, I, I just built a hole for my cordwood that's coming in this this year. I just uh, ripped down the old one that was there and built from the ground up. And uh, I like the creativity, the craftsmanship that you can do. Uh, and I've got limited amount of tools just having moved. But um, we have others here that, that uh, one gentleman that comes to mind who always helps out, Tony Rivera, who's our... Uh, in our technical, uh, boy, he can craft anything and he's got a true passion and he's got the tools to back it up. Mm. I've got the passion. I need more tools, but yeah, everyone needs more tools. I would say, <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's been a pleasure talking to you guys. I think it's been a really great interview. Uh, anything you want to tell or ask our listeners before we part company? For me, it's just, um, Thank you for having me on. I, I really don't want to come off as this, as if like a fast and master commercial that we're hyping up the company. I just love working for this company so much. We have solutions that really, really, truly help pros, whether it's not even bending over, having a sore back or just improving their business or improving their craftsmanship. Uh, so it's just not about us. Uh, it is about the pro. Uh, our company is very pro driven in that respect. So thank you for having me on. And I hope your listeners got something out of this. 
Um, I would only add a, you know, it's we have, um, I guess we're fortunate, uh, Dave and I, in that, again, I'm not just trying to say, uh, boy, with the greatest company we work for, but, um, you know, wherever you decide to plant your feet and uh, start, whether it be a career, um, you know, once I think once you spend 10 plus years like Dave and I here, um, you do treat it as a career. Find a place that's welcoming to uh, your skill set. And in my case, it was the geek side of me. The fun part of me allows me to spread uh, far from uh, new product development to the geeky testing part of it. Find something that feels like a home to you. Um, and so um, I thank Fasten Master for providing that for me. But I just would say to the audience out there, find that, whether it's a crew of three, that you love the fact they let you uh, do the rails on your own because you're great at it and they recognize that that's the place to be, you know, wherever that is, um, just realize that, that that's the part you really want to wake up and put on your uh, shoes in the morning for. Well, unfortunately, that is all the time we have today. Thanks to Dave Ellis and Mark Guthrie for joining me and thanks to all of you for listening. Please remember to send us your comments, questions, and suggestions to FHB Podcast at Taunton.com. And please like, comment, or view us however you're listening. It helps other folks find our podcast. Stay safe, everybody. Keep craft alive. Thanks very much for listening.